All right. Okay. Uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to speak. It's a very, I think, different audience than I typically interact with, which is a good thing for me. So um, I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, work I've been doing the past, say, six months or so uh, with, with EYT. Uh, I'm doing, finishing up my postdoc with EY at Oxford, and I'm moving to UBC this summer. Um, okay, so my, my background is in Bayesian statistics and, and machine learning, where symmetry plays a really important role and sort of always has. Um, and there's more recent literature, and I'll give some examples in a minute here. There's more recent literature in the, say, deep learning or neural networks where people are interested in building in symmetries into their neural networks. Uh, and so it seems like there should be a natural uh, relationship between the two, and that this work is really sort of born out of me trying to understand what, what the connections are between the two and whether we can foster any sort of expanded view uh, by, by taking these two viewpoints. So um, just a, a brief outline. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about symmetry in neural networks. And the easiest thing to visualize is permutation symmetry. So if you just imagine a multilayer perceptron or feedforward neural network, and you think about permuting the inputs, then what happens uh, the output. So when I talk about um, symmetry or invariance, I'm talking about tra transfer transformations of data and then uh, how our model might adjust. Um, and then I'll jump over to symmetry and probability and statistics. And the, the permutation invariance there is uh, goes by the name of exchangeability. So just for my own calibration, quick show of hands, uh, who, who knows what exchangeability is or who's heard of it? OK, great. That's good. OK, so um, I'll connect these two. Uh, and that's in the time allotted, that's probably as far as I'll get maybe the third, the third main bullet there. So if time allows, then I can, I can talk about more, more general uh, results. Um, but from my point of view, this is how I'm viewing deep learning. Just abstract away here. We have an input x and an output y, and a function mapping from <coughs> x to y happens to be a neural network. And if we compose enough of them together, then this is a deep neural network, and now we are doing deep learning. Okay, there's a lot more to it, obviously, but this is this is just sort of the basic the basic abstraction here. Um, so if we want uh, if we want symmetry, well, the first question is why why do we want symmetry, right? So we we know that deep learning can solve every problem we want it to. Just give it enough data and give it enough compute, and it will and it will do what we need we need it to. Okay, but Maybe we don't have lots of data, right? Maybe we, or the data is really expensive to obtain. So think about uh, this example here from a group in Amsterdam who's done, this group has done a lot of interesting work, especially with image data, um, where they have 3D volumetric scans of lungs, okay, pulmonary, pulmonary scans. And they're trying to detect these nodules as sort of precancer markers or even cancer markers. Uh, for a sort of next step of screening. So these images are time and, and money intensive to obtain, and then labeling them requires expert knowledge, right? So we're not gonna get a data set of millions of these things, you know. I, don't, I actually don't know what the maximum data set is, but, but 30,000 in this table is already quite a big data set for this, this type of data. Um, so, so the basic idea here is you have these you have these 3D images, and you think, okay, well, labeling the label of cancer or or, or not cancer on these nodules should be invariant to ro rotations in in 3D space, reflections, things like that. Um, and so, the work that that uh, they did here is actually incorporating those types of symmetries into the neural network architecture. And I'll, I'll dig into that a little more in a few slides, but just think. Okay, if I have some set of symmetry, some transformations of data, then I want my neural network, network architecture to be invariant under, so the output doesn't change if I transform my data that way, then, then uh, I'm going to be constraining my, my network architecture, and it's not obvious or trivial how you actually do that. So they worked out the details for some, some discrete rotations and, and, translation, uh, and reflections. And so the punchline here, the table at the bottom, so the left column tells you how big the sample size is for the training data set, and then five different network architectures with different uh, uh, test errors. And this, 
Z3 here. This is just uh, your standard convolutional neural network in three dimensions. Okay, so this, is trans this encodes translation invariance. And now if you encode other symmetries, so this, this colored thing on the right here represents one of the symmetry groups. I think it's D4 and D4H. Um, if you encode these other symmetries, you get much better data efficiency. So this is just demonstrated empirically here. I'll point out the third row, farthest right column. Um, they're getting testing accuracy of 0.85. Compare that to the bottom row of, of Z3. It's about, you know, roughly the same, it's doing a little better with a tenth of the data, right? So this, this is an interesting empirical result. Um, and so to formalize actually encoding symmetry, and I should say this, this, this here is, is a nice motivation for actually trying to understand what's going on here, right? So, uh, so formally, how do, we, how do we encode symmetry? Well, we have our, we have our function h mapping x to y, um, and there are two, two types of functional properties we're interested in. And so one is invariance, and that's just say, so g represents some transformation of the data that we're interested in, and so that's small, small g. Capital G is a group of these transformations. If you know what a group is, then that's great. If not, just think of this as a group of transformations that, that we're interested in, that we're gonna apply to our data. So these might be rotations or reflections, translations, permutations, things like that. Um, so invariance just says I can apply any of these transformations to my input data and it doesn't change the output of the function, okay? That's, that's property one. And then uh, there's a second property which generalizes this, which is equivariance, which just says my, my transformation of my data will commute with applying the function. So I can either, if I transform my input data and then run it through this function, it's the same as not, trans not transforming my input data, running it through the function, and then transforming the output. Okay, so this somehow preserves the symmetry and, and transmits it, say, to the output of the function so that now if we start composing equivariant functions, we, we preserve the symmetry. And if at the end we stack on an invariant function, this whole thing is invariant. Okay, so this is the sort of basic deep neural network encoding invariance where you have a bunch of equivariant layers and an invariant layer at the end. Okay, so that's the basic abstraction. Now, if we want to understand what's going on theoretically, then, then what this turns into is say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that H, this function, belongs to some class of functions, which maybe is a specific class of neural network architecture, say a feed-forward neural network, fully connected layers, some, some number of hidden layers, some number of, of nodes in each layer. And then if I say I want from this, from this class of, of networks, and by class I mean say different settings of the weights and biases, from this class of networks, if I want my input and my output to satisfy some symmetry property, then how, does, how is my class of, of architectures restricted? Okay, so this, this sort of question has been asked and, and answered in specific cases uh, in a bunch of settings. So the same group from Amsterdam applied this to continuous, uh, continuous rotations. So this is like um, uh, data, so geospatial uh, uh, data, stuff that, that lies on a sphere. Um, uh, it's been applied to input sets where we think that we can apply a permutation to our input and it will leave the output invariant. And this deep sets paper is really the one that caught my attention because it's so closely related to, to ideas uh, in Bayesian statistics. Uh, and there's been more recent work uh, uh, generalizing that, those sorts of architectures. Uh, and, then, and then there's been a bunch of interest in applying these ideas to graph-structured graph input, where, say, doing quantum chemistry, um, uh, modeling interactions, and that sort of thing. Okay, so all of these are, are very interesting and, and typically the, the structure of the paper is here's our data, or here's the, here's the uh, group of transformations we want, we want to respect. Here's an architecture that we propose and then they show that it's equivariant or invariant and then they apply it and they get good results. So, um, so really I'd, I'm trying to approach this from, from, from a more general uh, way and, and, and really answer this question, this boss question, right? Okay, and, and a historical note, 
Uh, interest in this sort of thing goes back to sort of some of the foundational works in the neural network literature. Um, even the book uh, on perceptrons by Minsky and Popper have, have a bit on, on group symmetry. And then uh, John Shaw Taylor did a bunch of work in, in the 90s uh, with some of this stuff. OK, so, so why symmetry? I had this example at the beginning where we get good sample efficiency. Um, basically, in all these papers, it, if we encode symmetry into the network architecture, it's claimed that it's a good thing, capital G, capital T. Um, you can understand this heuristically as typically when you do this, the, the weights will get shared. So you have a reduction in the dimension of the weight space. So, so if you imagine uh, sort of imposing no symmetry requirements on your network architecture, you have as many weights as you can fit in there. And now every symmetry that you require your network to, uh, to respect places a further constraint on, on the architecture, right? So the more constraints you place on it, the, f the more reduction in weight space you get. Um, and so heuristically, that's what's happening. And then if you stack these together, you're, you're you know, capturing structure at, at, multiple at multiple scales. OK, this, the heuristics are nice. And, and empirically, that, that is, uh, seems to be the case. Um, it's ongoing work to really understand this uh, theoretically. Okay. Um, so probably the simplest example to, to really visualize is, is this permutation invariance. So this was the deep sets paper that I, that I showed the, the title of before. Um, so if you consider an input sequence just with the picture for elements. And we act on this input sequence with a permutation denoted by pi here. So it just shuffles the elements of the sequence around. And now we say we want the output to, to be invariant to all permutations of the input. Okay, so the types of problems you might, you might think about here are set completion, where you say there's, uh, uh, you treat the elements in a shopping basket as, inter as it doesn't matter which order you see them in, and it's really just what's in the shopping basket, and you want to suggest one more, something like that. Okay? So if that's the case, then uh, there's, this, there's this nice result in this deep sets paper that says for every function h that is invariant to permutations, there's some corresponding uh, representation with h tilde and phi, where you apply this phi function to the elements of, of the input, and then sum them and run it through, through an outer function. OK, so if I told you that the, just start with the function on the right is your model, it's pretty easy to see that that's invariant to permu under permutation, right, because of this sum. But the fact that for every invariant function h, there, there exists this pair h tilde and phi is, is, seems a bit magical. Um, and and that, that's something that, that you know, I've been trying to understand. So um, this, is, this is sort of one, one of the nice results. And the second result in this paper is if, they, if you start with, uh, say, a fully connected feedforward neural network layer, then, and you require equivariance under permutation, then, then they show that the only, the only weight, the only structure that actually satisfies that reduces down to two weights. Okay, so you go from having n, n squared weights per layer to two. Um, and you can think about this as, as sort of a convolution where each of the elements in Y has a receptive field just of, of its corresponding element in X, and then the sort of structureless goo that is the rest of the sequence without, without any order, OK? So these two, these two results can be combined then um, by composing equivariant layer after equivariant layer after equivariant layer, and at the end, using an invariant layer, and the whole thing is invariant. OK, so this is what, what the deep sets paper did. And it led to a bunch of follow-up work that just sort of improved on, on some of these results. But at the time, led to some, some sort of very nice uh, empirical results. So, OK, so we have these two sort of magical results that, that greatly simplify the problem, right? We, the, the top one is quite general. The, the bottom one you know, restricts, restricts the view to a specific neural network architecture, but reduces the, the parameter space from, say, n squared weights per layer to two weights per layer. Right? So can we understand these in statistical and probabilistic terms? And 
are they as general as possible for permutation invariance, and, and do they generalize to other symmetries? Right, so permutation invariance is not the only thing that we might be interested in. Um, are the corresponding results both on top of the first and the second box there? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna jump over to probability and statistics branch. Okay, so this is my bad joke slide. This is actually a second iteration of, of the jokes. It's, I think it's better than the other one because people laughed at this one, so at least <laughs> ironically. Um, okay, so so this, that's all the deep learning motivation, and, and that's sort of a that was a quick overview of, of, of the literature in the past, say, three years um, in the, in, for some of these symmetries. Um, now I'll, I'll talk about it in sort of different language that is more comfortable for me and probably less comfortable for some of you, but we'll see if we can, we can uh, come together. And the idea here now is to Treat to, to, to treat these as random variables. So capital, capital letters here are random variables. Um, so I'm, put, I'm inputting a random sequence uh, of length n. And now a statistical model of that sequence of length n is just a family of probability distributions. Yeah? With some, it's parameterized or indexed somehow, okay? And so now if we, this sort of corresponding question to what I asked before is, if, if our random variables, if this should be x sub n, if our random variables are, and their distributions are assumed to satisfy a symmetry property, how is the model restricted? Okay, and that question has a much longer history uh, going back at least to Laplace, um, and, and uh, more, more recently, sort of since the 1930s, there's been a very active literature in the probability and statistics literature. Right? So there's um, a lot of tools here. The sort of canonical one, at least from, from a Bayesian point of view, is exchangeability. So we say a distribution P on, on the space where the sequence lives is exchangeable if the, that distribution does not change when we permute the elements of the sequence. Okay? So this is a slightly weaker form of invariance than what I showed before, um, where we're just talking about probabilities, okay? And this is for a finite length sequence. And now, if we have, if we treat our finite length, se length if we treat our finite length sequence as the prefix of an infinitely long sequence, and we say every finite subsequence is exchangeable, then we have what's known as infinite exchangeability, and this leads to somewhat famous Definetti's theorem on which m much of Bayesian statistics and machine learning relies, okay? Um, and it just says that this infinitely long sequence is exchangeable if and only if the elements of the sequence are iid from some random distribution q. When I, okay, so there just says there's some random distribution q that if I condition on it, I can just sample the elements of my sequence iid. Okay, so from a modeling point of view, we go from, okay, I have, a, I have to specify some possibly arbitrarily complicated probabilistic model on this infinitely long sequence to now I only have to specify my model by considering distributions on elements of the sequence, right? And then inference is just picking a distribution uh, that, that we think gave rise to that, that sequence. Yeah? So that's a huge simplification. There are a bunch of analogous theorems for other symmetries. Um, and so I have some references here. I'm happy to share the slides if you're, if you're interested. Okay, so why study symmetry from a probabilistic perspective? Well, if you come from a Bayesian stats and machine learning background, it's sort of a natural thing to do. But more, more pragmatically, uh, as a rule of thumb, probability often makes a problem easier. Okay, if you spend a bit of time uh, learning some of the tools, it makes problems easier in that, that oftentimes if there are hard constraints, hard combinatorial constraints, the probability will just sort of soften them or smooth them. Uh, and we have a lot of well-established tools for working with invariant distributions. So I think this, I should put a box around this. This thing on the bottom is, you know, if you only take one thing away from this talk, is that distributional symmetry decomposes a problem 
into structure we care about and random noise. Okay, so I'll, I'll give a concrete example of that. So if we have just a finite sequence, so forget the infinite lo infinitely long sequence now, if we just have a finite sequence that we say is exchangeable, we, we no longer get the affinity's theorem, but there is sort of an analogous thing where, um, where we just collect the values in the sequence in this thing called the empirical measure. So imagine getting a sequence x sub n, and you, you record the values, say, on a set of uh, colored balls and throw them in a ball pit, and then my daughter jumps in the ball pit and throws the balls back out randomly, then the, and we keep track of them in the order they appear, that is, that's just a, a random, obs uh, r random realization of x sub n, right? So the structure we care about are the values in the sequence, and the random noise is just the order, the random order in which they appear, okay? So in the language of statistics, that means the, the empirical measure is a sufficient statistic. Okay, it captures all of, the relevant dis all of the relevant information about the distribution of x. And that right there is sort of the key, the key thing to make, make the connection between the two. So, so now if, we, if you can sort of boil it down to these, these sufficient statistics, then, then you, can, you can bridge over to, to what's going on in the deep learning literature. So there's a couple of intermediate steps. Uh, I'm going to skip that, but uh, sort of the main intermediate step is that you can you can basically there's this theorem from probability that says for every uh, x and y, every pair of random variables, so this would be input and output, I can map from the input to the output by just injecting some random noise into some function. Okay, this is, this is sort of just a high-level theoretical result that says I can take probability distributions and properties of probability distributions and turn them into functional representations. Okay, and, and sort of in machine learning or deep learning, this often arises in, in the form of, of the reparameterization trick. Okay, this just says I can take some, some outsource noise. It doesn't have to be uniform. It could be normal. It could be just anything that then we run through a function. There is some function that will produce this y, okay? So if we have, if we have that tool, then, then we can characterize the structure of, of this invariant. So the probabilistic, the probabilistic uh, condition here is then that you get this joint invariance under permutation. So I permute the inputs as a random variable. And this, e this equal with a D assign over is just equal in distribution. So imagine there's a, a, a P on, on both sides of, of, the, of the equation there. So the probability, the joint probability of the permuted input and then the output uh, is equal to the probability of, of the unpermuted output or the unpermuted input and the output. Okay, so if that's true, then we know there exists some function that that is, will produce a, a, a valid sample of y that's just a function of the empirical measure, just a function of the values of, of the sequence, uh, of the input sequence, and some random noise, okay? So going back to, to this result from the beginning, um, if you sort of dig into the proof in the deep sets paper, what they're doing with this phi function is basically constructing the empirical measure from in some special cases, okay? so. This is basically, uh, you, can, you can imagine the empirical measure as a one-hot one encoding in, in X space of, of our input sequence, and then run through a function to, 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 put, to get our, our, our output. Okay, and you can, you can say something similar uh, with equivariance, um, where uh, you can recover sort of this, this early result, um, with the same sort of structure. Okay, and now, now we get we get that the elements of, of the output are equal to the elements of the uh, functions of elements of the input and the empirical measure and, and their own random noise variable. Okay. Okay, are there any questions on this before I so the next slide generalizes beyond permutation. So before I go any further, are there any questions on the permutation of variance.
Okay. Ah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, no. So the the left side, the left side is sort of as a special case of the of the right, where we ignore the noise and impose this this feed forward structure on it. So the right side is sort of. Uh, so the left side is a computation graph. The right side is something like a computation graph, but with sort of arbitrary functions rather than weights connecting them. Does that make sense? So if, if, I, if I restrict my, my class of functions h tilde to, to have this, this feed forward architecture, then I would get back to the left side. Yeah. OK, so if we're interested in more general symmetries, uh, all of these ideas with permutation symmetry sort of have, have a, uh, a corresponding entity uh, in, in the more general case. So, um, so a group is just sort of uh, this nice structured um, algebraic object uh, that, we, that we use to define operations on the input space. And so um, you can talk about something called the orbit of, the, of any element of the in input space as the subset of the input space that I can that I can obtain just by transforming it, right? So in the case of rotations of an image, the orbit of an image is are just the rotated versions of the image, okay? Uh, and then there's an idea. There's this idea from from classical statistics of a maximal invariant statistic, which has this really useful property that it uh, it's constant on any orbit, so it's invariant, and it takes a different value on each orbit, so it indexes the orbits, and this is what the empirical measure was doing, right? It sort of identified these equivalence classes of input sequence uh, just by the values in the input sequence, okay? And then there's this other object called a, a maximal equivariant, which basically sets up a frame of reference between, uh, that we use for, for the uh, in equivariant rep representation. So, the, the sort of general theorem here then is is analogous in, in, to the permutation case where now it's just G is a is a is a compact group, um, and rather than than exchangeability, we have the X is invariant uh, under the action of the group, and now if I take any maximal invariant, so this is the object that corresponds to the empirical measure, then I can find a representation of, of X and Y in terms of uh, X and then just a function of the empirical of the invariant uh, maximal invariant and random noise. Okay, and sort of the way to understand the structure of that is that this joint distribution um, of X and Y doesn't change when I apply any element of the group, and you can show that that implies that that Y and X are conditionally independent given M. So M captures that structure we care about. That's the maximal invariant. It captures the structure of X that we care about. And then the random noise just produces a, a random sample uh, of Y given, given uh, the mass one variant. Okay. And there's a sort of this, uh, the equivariant counterpart then requires this maximal equivariant. Um, and we get this nice, um, this nice representation uh, in terms of in terms of an equivariant function, which shows up in a lot of the, the, the in a lot of the deep learning literature, so so the structure of this thing then is, I set up, so again cartoon of orbits in X space on the left, and now tau this maximal equivariant allows me to set up this frame of reference, where I map every element of an orbit to some representative, and then each representative cor corresponds to a distribution over the orbits in Y. And then I sort of undo that, that application of tau to generate y. Okay, so here, here the structure we care about is, is, is sort of the, 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 this frame of reference uh, in, between x and y. Okay, so, so the sort of some answers are provided uh, by, the, by, the, by the theorems here, which is that to really understand these, these results from the beginning, uh, from the deep learning literature, uh, you, can, you can understand some of that magic in terms of these ideas of sufficiency and, and adequacy. And these are ideas that go back a long way in the statistics literature and, and have, uh, have a lot of uh, usefulness. 
Um, and then we developed some sort of, you know, the general theory, which catches a lot of existing work, but then we, in, in this archive paper, we, 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 get, we drive the details of, of specific representations for uh, graphs, arrays, tensors, and sequences, okay? Um, in, our, in my mind, it raises a lot of questions, which is, which is um, you know, sufficiency and, and group symmetry sort of have this correspondence, but it's not always the case that there's a group corresponding to a sufficient statistic. Sufficient statistics pop up all the time. So, uh, you know, so the natural question is, when you have sufficient statistics without necessarily a group symmetry, um, are, you know, are those corresponding to any interesting problems? <clears throat> And then, and then trying to put this good thing on rigorous footing, this you know better, better training and better generalization through symmetry. Um, this is sort of the first step there because most of the methods you use to prove results about training and generalization rely on some notion of randomness, right? So, so, so bringing probability distributions into the picture is sort of the first step. It's the first step there. So, um, with that, I'll finish, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> so your data augmentation will work in theory, for sure. Um, I think to the extent that there have been sort of direct comparisons, this is a question that I'm also interested in. Um, to the extent there have been direct comparisons in experiments, um, it appears that incorporating the symmetry into the architecture is better, um, but it's still, I can't. I can't really tell you much more than that. Um, but it's something I'm. I'm thinking about too, from a sort of a, a more theoretical standpoint. But I think there are a lot of experiments that that might uh, might let you get at that. I think uh, in a lot of these cases, the depending on the group symmetry you have, they can be quite computationally expensive. And so then you might be interested in this trade-off between okay, not, you know, augmenting your data set so you have a it takes longer to train just because you have a bigger data set versus having a computation expensive model. I'm, I'm not sure at this point what, what, the, what the relative trade-off would be, but um, it's, it's certainly very interesting. Hello. Uh, so uh, thanks for the talk, by the way. Um, there's one question I have, which, so it's, I'm not going to stricto sense you talk about group uh, action of groups, right? But if you have a, di a differential operator on uh, on whichever function, so for example, you want to learn the result of uh, whichever differential equation, right? Mm -hmm. um, you usually have a form like you know operator times function equals function. Do you think you could just kind of apply the same type of ideas so as to learn the structure of a network that would try to uh, get into a solution of the differential equation? Uh, possibly. I think it would, do, I mean, these types of results that rely on the group really rely on the nice structure of groups. So I think there might be some cases with some operators that have enough structure that you can, that you can do that. Um, in general, I'm not sure. Uh, I guess it would depend on the details. But it's an interesting idea. Uh, so we'll take the question behind you, and then if there are no more, then we'll return to you. Um, in the case of permutation invariance, you had those two functions, h and phi. Yeah. Um, does that theorem that you had, does it just um, prove that 
the existence of those functions, or does it say anything about them? Yeah, so uh, here, yeah, it just it just proves the existence. Um, and in, in the literature, there's sort of this growing body of literature now that's suggesting different architectures. And really, all this says is that this, this result on the right says that there exists some function that has to be symmetric under permutations um, of your input. Um, it's still sort of an open modeling question of, and it's problem dependent of what what further assumptions should you make or what, what further restrictions should you make? Should you just do sort of a single, an element-wise embedding and then sum? Should you use a max? Uh, should you do pairwise multiplication, things like that? Um, it sort of, uh, sort of depends on the problem, I think. You sort of have to guess what that function is to utilize the symmetries in the neural network. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend guessing, but uh, <laughs> uh, I think at this point, this doesn't say anything about that. This, this, this theorem doesn't say anything about that. Um, there's, there's some recent work by a different group at Oxford that, um, that sort of looks at what the, what the dimension of, of this inner function has to be in order to continuously represent uh, these elements. And okay, it has to be at least the size, at least the, or, at least the dimension of, of the input sequence. Okay, so basically it says you can't compress away any of the information if you just want to assume continuity. If, but you can, there, there, are other, there are other papers um, looking at, say, attention mechanisms and doing these sort of self-interactions, which for, say, clustering tasks appear to do a better job, but it really depends on, on the task at hand. Um, there's a bit, we have a bit in the paper about this sort of trade-off between uh, the complexity of the function and the, and the complexity of the statistics you use uh, versus you know, what's actually needed. Um, but, but at this point, there's no sort of rigorous, uh, rigorous theory about that. We have time for one more. I don't know if you still have your question up there or? So that, there's been quite a lot of work, well, as of late done on the monotonicity of uh, neural networks as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a different kind of structure and that's n not group either, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. But it's, it's an operator that you could just try and uh, find translations, mm -hmm. uh, translation uh, uh, invariants, I yeah. guess, instead of symmetry ones. Would, would that apply at all? Yeah, I think that that should, so depending on the domain, translation is not a compact group, but you can adapt some of these results to, to non-compact groups when I think uh, in that case, you might be able to, to find something, yeah. Last question. Quick question about how you would um, represent um, uh, rotational symmetry in a neural network because it seems it would be discretized by yeah. having a finite number of inputs. Yeah. So either you can discretize or this paper by um, Taco Cohen and, and collaborators in Amsterdam transform everything uh, into Fourier space and did things in Fourier space and then undid it. So it can be quite computationally expensive. Um, they have a more recent paper approximating that on the icosahedron, which is interesting, but a whole different, uh, whole different thing. Yeah.